Good afternoon and welcome to our service of Evensong on this first Sunday of Lent. No doubt you are already enjoying, perhaps that's not the right word, but participating in different things to do with Lent and I hope that our service this afternoon will encourage you and inspire you as we progress through on our Lenten journey. The choir are now going to sing Psalm 119, verses 17 to 32. Here begins the 15th verse of the second chapter of the book of Genesis. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. 
And the Lord God commanded the man, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Here ends the first lesson.
Here begins the 12th verse of the fifth chapter of St. Paul's letter to the Romans. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgressions of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many died through one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to the condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Here ends the second lesson.
and just forgive the sins of all them that are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness may obtain of thee the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Give unto thy servant.
May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The early books of Genesis present a profound challenge to anyone for whom the Bible is an authoritative text. How to read that story of creation in six days? How to read the story we heard today of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? The role of the crafty serpent, and first Eve's, then Adam's disobedience. These stories are expressed using mythological and poetic modes of expression. There are many things left unexplained, like whether the serpent was evil, and if so, what it was doing in the garden. And there are tensions, if not downright contradictions. The stories of the creation of humanity in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 contain enough differences for some early theologians to have suggested that the Bible teaches a two-stage creation process of humankind. It is as if the story of creation is a story which is designed to resist straightforward exegesis. Indeed, a quick scan of the various readings over the centuries only emphasises the variety of Christian interpretations. Some Christians today insist that Genesis informs us that the process of creation took place in literally six days. But that has by no means been the traditional interpretation. Most early interpreters of the book assumed that six days was a symbolic number. They were far more concerned to work out what those elusive opening words meant. Did the phrase in the beginning mean that God existed in time? What was God doing before the creation? They poured over the text to justify their belief that all three persons of the Trinity were involved in the creation. Great theologians like Augustine, whose views on God and time have deeply influenced our own, also used the first chapter of Genesis to back up their assumption that the earth was at the centre of the universe. Similarly, the story of Adam and Eve has been read in a bewildering variety of ways. Most commonly, it was read as an explanation, either literal or symbolic, of the beginnings of sin. But even here, commentators were divided as to where to place the blame. The early church theologian Tertullian, who is notorious for calling Eve the gateway to evil in one text, in another text squarely puts the blame on Adam, and in yet another place blamed the serpent. The relationship between Adam and Eve was scoured for what it might reveal about the relationships of men and women more generally, about sexual relationships, about marriage, about procreation, and about the equality or otherwise of the sexes. So, it is not just us who are asking these questions. They have been asked from the beginnings of the Christian movement although inevitably each generation asks these questions from their own perspective, in time and place. It's worth remembering, for example, that as the ascetic movement gathered pace from the second century onwards, most Christian commentators read the story of Adam and Eve not as an affirmation of marriage, but as a clear indication that the best form of life for everybody, was one of sexual abstinence. Monks and nuns were praised for returning to the state of Eden before the fall, and for reminding Christians what the eternal paradise of heaven would be like. According to the early church then, at least for many of them, marriage was not an evil, but rather it was a dim second best option, put in place by God, to deal with the effects of the fall. 
For some scholars of the Bible, these questions are of academic, but not of spiritual importance. For those of us, however, for whom the Bible is something more than a fascinating collection of literary texts, Genesis presents us with this challenge. It doesn't seem adequate to say that the variety of previous interpretations show us that the text can be made to say anything. That seems to me to be giving up too quickly. Nor is it possible, I think, to create a clear pattern of progressively better interpretation. Augustine's reflections on a geocentric universe skewed his reading of the creation narrative in ways that we would be unwilling to accept now. But his reflections on the goodness of creation and the way in which God is both transcendent to, yet intimately involved with creation, are still very much worth attending to. Not least because Augustine so clearly and cogently guards against the kind of literal interpretation which sees creation happening in six days. So this raises the question for us. How do we read the book of Genesis today in our own context in 2021 at the beginning of Lent as some of us begin our conversations on living in love and faith? I'm not going to attempt a detailed exegesis of the meaning of Adam and Eve's relationship here, you will no doubt be relieved. That would be to get in the way of conversations yet to come. What I would like to do, though, is to look squarely at the central message of the passage we heard today. The story of the fall is, at its core, a story about God's loving intention for creation to be fruitful and beautiful. The word Eden in Hebrew means delight. It is this which God intended. But the story of the fall tells also of the gap between God's intention for humanity and humanity's response. In my view, the most profound commentators on this passage dwell less on how that lapse happened and who was to blame, and more on acknowledging that this tension between delight and imperfection is where we all start in our relationship with God. Each child, however innocent, is born into a world marked with the effects of sin. Each child is loved by God. It seems then that it is worth reflecting on this as we reflect on the question of how we read the Bible. When confronted with passages like the beginning of Genesis, which resist and challenge an easy reading, it's very easy to focus our attention on the question of the status or the authority of the text. What does it say? What was the intention of the original author? What did the original Hebrew mean? What is the tension between divine inspiration and human authorship? But there's another perspective which is important to take into account, and that's the perspective of the reader. And that means us. If the story of Adam and Eve tells us anything, it seems to me, it tells us about the perpetual tendency of human beings to think that they know best. Adam and Eve are given instructions by God, quite clear ones, yet somehow they persuade themselves that they have a better idea. It is a story of pride and self-deception. It is a story about the attempt to put human power ahead of God. Bearing this in mind, one thing we can tell from the history of the way in which Christians have read Genesis is that this history is tragically marked precisely by this story of humans' ability to deceive themselves and to bolster their own power at the expense of others. Let's just look very briefly at three examples. 
In Genesis 9, we find a mysterious passage, an episode which describes Noah getting drunk and then Noah cursing one of his sons, Ham. It's very difficult to know how to read this, but the sad truth is that it was read for centuries as a way of creating a hierarchy between certain ethnic groups. The story is long and complicated, but in brief, the descendants of Ham, the cursed people, were associated with the people of Africa. The whole notion of the curse of Ham and the concept of the so-called Hamitic peoples became particularly potent in the era of the transatlantic slave trade and European imperial expansion into Africa. An embarrassing number of European biblical scholars continued to assert theories of racial hierarchy, supposedly based on the Bible, which put at the bottom precisely those peoples Europeans were using their power to enslave or otherwise abuse. Another example. It has become evident in recent years how certain readings of the creation narrative have been used to justify human exploitation of the natural environment. If humans have been given creation to dominate, one argument goes, then God has given it to humans to use as they wish. In its most extreme form, the exploitation of the Earth's resources has been justified on the grounds that this is God's will for bringing about the early end of the planet, regardless of the suffering this will cause. And again, the book of Genesis has been used all too often to teach the supposed natural inferiority of women to men. Genesis, it is said, teaches that woman is derivative of man, owes service to man, and must obey man. Look what happened when Eve disobeyed God and persuaded Adam to follow suit. That argument goes. The uncomfortable truth we need to face is that, unlike some of the more exceptional readings of Genesis that one could list, all of these views at various times and places could have been described as the traditional one. Regardless of how they began, all three readings of Genesis were used to assert power over others. The curse of Ham was used to justify the continued exploitation of certain other ethnic groups. The creation narrative has been used to justify the exploitation of the natural world, an exploitation which inevitably impacts most hard on those in a position of economic vulnerability. The text of Genesis has been used to exclude women from positions of intellectual, spiritual or political power. And we should also pause to remember that in all these cases, humans' tendency to deceive themselves has extended to using some supposedly neutral facts of science to back up the theories. So as we continue to read the Bible, as we grapple with whatever difficult questions are on our minds, I hope that we will not only focus on how we view the biblical text, but also on how we view ourselves as readers. We don't have to be hardline Calvinists, convinced of the total depravity of human nature, to believe that we are capable of self-deception when we read the Bible. And one way of being alert to this is to keep on asking difficult questions about power. Where does the power lie in my context? Whose power does my reading protect? Who is made vulnerable? And let us also focus particularly on the vulnerable. 
For from our reading today, we learn that we are all loved by God. We are all created for that Eden of God's delight. So may God give us the grace to love as we are loved. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for all your great goodness towards us. We thank you for the world and all the good things in it, for the sky above us, the earth beneath our feet, for the changing seasons, the sunshine and the rain, for our homes, our relations and friends. Help us not to take your goodness for granted, but constantly to give you thanks, not only by what we say, but by the way we try to please you in everything we do through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Teach us, O God, to use this season of Lent that we may be drawn closer to our Lord and in fellowship with him may learn to hate sin, to overcome temptation and to grow in holiness, that our lives may be strengthened for your service and used for your glory. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. O Lord, as we enter Fair Trade fortnight, We pray that each crop produced in our country and in our world may fetch a fair price, with each worker being paid justly. We pray that the simple choices we make, what tea to drink, what fruit to eat, may honour God and his bountiful creation. God loves every single person involved in the production of every single item we eat. May we reflect his love by doing all we can to ensure that they are paid fairly for the work that they do. Lord, we offer these prayers to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And in our diocesan cycle of prayer today, We pray for our link Diocese of Cyprus and the Gulf. And we pray especially for St George's Church in Baghdad, which receives Iraqi people from different Christian denominations. We pray that its clinic, its kindergarten, Mother's Union branch and Redeemer School continue to flourish. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And we hold before you, Lord, all those who are in need at this time, remembering all those who are suffering from coronavirus and those who are suffering due to the coronavirus and perhaps that operations have had to be delayed. We pray that you are there with them, giving them strength and courage. We pray for all those that we have been asked especially to pray for, for Rosemary, John, Jane, Scylla, Catherine, Paul, Leslie, Nigel, Simon, David, Richard, Denise, Barbara, David, Emily, Charles, Tom, Bill, David, William, Jacqueline, Sue, Joy, Maggie, Pam and her family, Sue, and His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh. We hold before you, Lord, all those who have recently been bereaved, that you may be a light in their darkness of grief, praying especially for Judith, Vivian and Catherine. And we know, Lord, that we come, when we come to the end of our lives, you are there to receive us. 
your arms are open to us. So we ask that Jan, Lucien, Shati, Sylvia, Chris, Maureen, Tommy, Bex and Tony may rest in peace and rise in glory. So Lord, we hold all our prayers before you in Jesus' name. Amen. And the blessing. Christ, give you grace to grow in holiness, to deny yourselves, take up your cross and follow him. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.